Perhaps I'll start with a story at great risk to my reputation. A couple, a man and a woman, are happy. She loves the town, the house, her friends, the work she does. The husband doesn't like his work very much. He wants his boss's job. But the boss is going nowhere. He can't take his job. So he decides he will apply for a job across the sea. And the wife says, no, no, no. You can't do this. I don't want to move across the sea. I want to stay here. And he says, oh, no, no. I want the job over there. I want the good job. I want my boss's job. Good job here is like my boss's job even better. Two weeks later, the husband comes home and says, our problems are solved. My boss is leaving for that job. And I get to take my boss's job. And the wife says, yes, I recommended your boss for that job. Creative, yes? Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm going to share sort of a variety of perspectives, thoughts about creativity that have occurred to me in my work. And I started a center for research on creativity in California um, two years ago. After spending many years researching arts education, art and its impact on children, and doing short-term studies in classrooms, doing long-term studies. Two and a half years ago, I published this book. It's titled Doing Well and Doing Good by Doing Art. And the uh, information for this book came from a study of 12,000 children beginning at age 12 or 13 for 12 years to age 26. And we knew from the data collection many things about the children's experiences in school, uh, the kinds of art they studied, how much, how many lessons, um, their interests, their families, their uh, school records, and so forth. And so we looked at what the youth did in grades 8 through 12 in the US. It's middle school to high school, secondary school. And then looked at what happened afterwards. College success, uh, values, attitudes, and um, political behavior, a variety of things. And the, the two most important lessons that come out of this book, and of course, a professor can take one lesson and turn it into 180 pages. But the two important lessons were that the, the children, and these were, we focused on the poor children, children, low-income families, inner city children, that one, they did a lot better in a variety of things. They went further in college. They got better uh, exams, better grades in college. Uh, they got higher degrees. And perhaps, I mean, that's important, but even as important were these children who were uh, involved intensively in art engaged in more pro-social behavior as adults. They volunteered with various groups, children's groups. They volunteered with their churches. They, and, and so caring for other people became important. And they also engaged more in political processes. They registered to vote. They voted more often, and so forth. So doing well academically, being more empathetic, let's say, were important outcomes of engagement in the arts that I talk about in this. And, um, I had done a series of studies 
that looked at similar things. What do children learn when they learn music? Certain types of music. Does that, and in many cases that does, boost spatial reasoning skills? Spatial reasoning skills are vital, not only for mathematics, but for science and for language. Okay. Um, there's, an over, uh, there's an overriding perspective that I want to introduce and it's one that I could use throughout this conference. I would have a place to put many things I hear according to this framework. I have it stuck on my bed. Okay. Um, we all, f at first chance, think of creativity as uh, a process, a brain function, a thought process, I mean, that's sort of what we think of. And, and some processes are more creative than others. Some generate more ideas than others, and so forth. But I like the terms, and these are terms that our police detectives use when they solve crimes. And maybe you will recognize them. One is having the means to do something. The means to do something. What's the next? Who can tell me? Means. Next. Skills. Nothing to do with skills. Motive. Okay. So the means for many of you, uh, wahend. Yes, wahend. The means. Ooh, you did it. Okay. The motive is motive. Motive. And the third, third is. Act, no, it's opportunity. So now that would be way malas, way malas. So we have, um, <laughs> we have my stickies, we have a wahend, motif, and way malas. Okay, notice I did not use skills, okay. So one assumption, one a thought that I have about creativity that I feel is important is that we're all creative in many different ways. And that's not just, oh, we're all good or we're all, we all can learn. We're all creative. And just to give you an example, uh, a 10-year-old child in school is given a science problem a problem to figure out the answer in a science subject. And the child is given some time, opportunity to solve this, his own way or her own way. And the child thinks of an idea that the child has thought of himself, the child's own idea. That's being creative. It didn't come from somewhere else, right? It came from the child. So the child has an idea. And the idea helps answer the problem. It leads to the answer. Or the idea tells the child, no, there's no answer there with that idea. I need another idea. Okay? Comes up with another idea that leads to the answer. The child's being creative. Creativity is, um, is part of many cognitive processes. Creativity is not just inventing a technology. It's not just inventing something new and glorious. It's not just creating an artwork that's very moving or aesthetic. Creativity is coming up with something that's novel and has some value. And if you look across the literature on creativity anywhere, the main ingredients of something that is creative, a thought that's creative, a product that's creative, an artwork that's creative, which is a product, to be creative, it should have the two qualities. It should be novel, it should be new, 
and should be valuable. Okay? But once those things are established, then the fight begins. New to whom? New to me, new to you, new on the planet, uh, or valuable? Valuable to whom? Valuable just to me, valuable to a critic. Okay, so let me just move through a couple of images here. Um, so we're going to talk about what we mean by creativity, perhaps what we should mean by cre creativity, and I'm already in that space. Uh, the notions of creativity skills and dispositions in um, learning psychology, learning science, in the United States, and many of you, I, I don't know where these terms fit in, in some other languages and other conceptions, but learning science is, is common worldwide. We think of, when we think of, say, critical thinking, is critical thinking important in your language about education? Yes? Yes? Who? Oh. Yes? No? We well, think so. It's a very, very popular, important idea. We think of, um, when we think of that, we think of skills to be, to critically think, and we also think of dispositions. Another word for that would be inclinations. Another word for that would be motivations to think critically. So it's not, not only a matter of skills, but it's also a matter of sort of getting around to doing it or being motivated to doing that. So we're going to talk about that a little more. And um, the fact that dispositions toward creativity, this is my 3.2 right here. Um, dispositions may be very, very important in classrooms. I think they are. Uh, and then uh, I will say some things about assessing instruction for creativity. Let me introduce uh, just another thought. Several of us went to a beautiful school in Estonia yesterday. We visited. Five years old, uh, teacher, first grade teacher. Yes, yes, in the back. Oh, she went to sleep. Yeah. No, no, no. I know, I'm kidding. I just give her a hard time. Um, showed us around the school. The children will be there on September 1st. Uh, the school is immaculate. It's white, it's glass, it's wood pine floors, and the rooms are beautiful and clean. And, and we, see, uh, we see a room for cooking, like TV, Top Chef, uh, you know, a cooking range and oven and cooktops and cupboards. You go uh, oatmeal and, and spices and, oops, wine glasses. <laughs> yes? Cooking. But they, up here, the 10-year-olds can't reach the wine glass. Uh, then we go to the wood shop. And a gentleman, the wood shop instructor, is explaining his shop. And it's got wonderful tools, wonderful heavy workbenches, uh, hand tools and boxes and all arranged, and uh, a drill press, and uh, a lathe that the children use. Then some tools that they can't use, very fancy professional tools that he uses. And we see rooms with art materials, lovely art materials, and music space, dance space. And so hold that idea, hold that picture. Now adopt another picture. I am in discussions with the Ministry of Education in Scotland. And Scotland's ministry and the governors, the legislators, the parliamentarians 
uh, are very interested in creativity in that society. So they want to do an inspection, a survey of schools in Scotland to be able to say, what is the state of creativity in Scottish education? So I discussed with the person who is in charge of that. And one thing that person might do, well, she and her people, her assistants, are going to go out into the schools to look. Okay? So now go back to this other picture. Let's assume that this Estonian school was one of the schools in Scotland being inspected. But there were no children there, just like this, empty, beautiful. So the inspector comes in. What can the inspector say about creativity at that school? Think for a minute. You are the, you are the brain from the ministry, and you go to the school, the one I described, and you must come away and say to the minister something about creativity in that school. Think for a minute. Uh, any immediate reaction to that prospect? Sorry? There are means. There's the, the means and the opportunity, yes? Motive? We don't know. We don't really know. And so, I mean, that, that's an important perspective to think about when we talk about creativity, where it's happening, how it's happening, what we think of it is to think, are we talking about the means to creativity when we think about creative policies for our schools? More space for music, more halls for dance, more uh, shop and creative uh, craft art experiences? Are we talking about opportunity? Well, opportunity is uh, not only having the means, but opportunity means something else that's very, very important. In American schools, the day is short. Children come at perhaps 8 o'clock in the morning. And in the city, in Los Angeles, in New York, where we have um, many children whose, limited, whose English skills, English language skills are limited, so they must have sort of extra training in language, they will spend from 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock noon in reading and reading-related exercises, not even writing for the most part, reading. And then have lunch and come back, and now there are maybe 90 minutes left. Space for science, space for math, space for social studies, space for not much else, and even that is very short. So when we think about opportunities for creativity, if the curriculum is very packed with things that teachers must do, must teach, must, in, in um, our language, cover. Cover is a terrible word in education. What it tends to mean is that, in its worst sense, the teacher has read from the book for 40 minutes. That covers it. Tomorrow, the next 40 pages. That covers that. So, but we have that problem. Our teachers cover things. And covering things typically does not allow any room for children to be creative within the subject. So if you want children to be creative in science, you can't just do worksheets that point to inventions and people and the times of different scientific eras. You must give children a problem to solve that 
makes them stretch themselves and think of ideas that connect to science and allow some creativity into the curriculum. So that, that again, in my big map where means, motive, opportunity matter, that's part of opportunity, is making space for creativity in the curriculum. Uh, another quick example, and I'll, I'm only up to the second slide. Someone decided not to come? I will take two hours. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, a high school director, headmaster, says, Oh, we have a wonderful orchestra program, a musical orchestra program. Therefore, we are a creative school. And I say, maybe, but maybe not. Yes? Because you can spend six years from age six to 12 learning to play the violin and getting better and better sound and more fluid and so forth and not have done much that's creative the whole time. If you want a creative music program, there are two principal ways that I think of this. One is you have children write music, write their own music, directly creative thought. Okay. Here's my five note composition. Do you know that if you take all the dimensions of musical notes in reasonable limits, from so 64th notes or 32nd notes to half note, no, full notes, whole notes, and every dynamic and every attack and every timbre, there are 100 million songs that have only three notes. Just multiply all the dimensions out. Okay, so a child writing 10 notes is probably being creative, unless he's copying something that he's heard or she's heard. So the, you know, the point is that art, music, dance, theater, they line up on spectrums. Some are very creative. Some are not very creative. Okay. And just to close the loop here, now I'm the Scottish inspector. So I go to a school and they show me the orchestra. And they say they are a very musical school and I ask some questions and what does that mean? Well, we have an orchestra, we have a string quartet, we have a band, uh, we have a drumming circle. And I come away and I say, how shall I characterize this school? in its creativity. I still don't know unless someone tells me about creative things that are happening at this school. So it's just, okay. So um, here, not oh, advertisements. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just to go over a couple of things. So when we think of things that are new, um, by the way, I think they're going to put a video of this online. If any of you email to me, I will send you my slides, my PowerPoint directly. Okay, so new ideas. These are new ways of accomplishing things. So new manufacturing processes, uh, uh, new ways of travel, so forth, new products, new things to accomplish that we've never done. New, you know, sort of new ways of connecting ideas, new ways of seeing things. These are all examples of, of creative, uh, of, of new things that come along and, and that come along because people have thought of them or teams of people have thought of them. Okay, so these are new. And, but then the question is, what's the criterion? What are the criteria for being new? And if you look at come, you know, popular books, and even somewhat scholarly books about creativity, Howard Gardner, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, well, that's a tough one. Um, 
they tend to be talking about extraordinary creativity. The Leonardo da Vinci's, the, the Martha Graham's in dance, the people doing things that just uh, impress you tremendously and have taken, been captured by the world. Uh, so new on the planet or new in the marketplace, a new invention, a new device for your car, uh, uh, somebody invented an electric razor at one point, 100 years ago, or new in a specific context. So I'm going to call the, the scientific idea that the child had, um, thinking about a way to solve a problem in class as a specific context, a very small, a small context. That's fine. It's still creative, in my view. If, if you as a scholar or as an author of a book choose to focus on extraordinary creativity, I have no problem with that. But I think the authors who have done that, in a sense, mislead us into thinking that that's the creativity that matters. When I think the creativity that matters is this one, because it's, it's, our, it's all of us. We're not inventing new devices that are going to show up in your car. We're not inventing new ways of manufacturing things cheaper or with less oil but we're inventing things for ourselves all the time and solving problems all the time. So to me, I, I take this whole world and I put it upside down. And I leave Leonardo, fine. You know, Michelangelo, fine. Children, ah, yes. That's the creativity that, that I like to think about. OK, then I also said value. So valuable or meaningful ideas. So the value of a creative idea, well, some examples, you would accomplish something more efficiently, has value, might make, uh, in a way, it makes accomplishing something less resource intensive or cheaper or other, that sort of thing, or quicker. Um, connecting ideas to create new and valuable perspectives. That's a hugely important thought in education. So we connect one idea to another. We create metaphors for how we understand things. We create such visions or images or metaphors, and we learn. And that, that goes back to cognitive science briefly. Uh, if you have something you don't know anything about, uh, I'll be home at 5. Um, if you create some, if you look at something, examine something, you don't know anything about it, typically the way you learn something about it is through metaphors, which is, oh, you don't know this? Well, it's like this. Oh, now I can say something about it. Teachers use meta that kind of metaphor all the time for new things. I mean, what are you going to, what are you going to, how are you going to fix a new object, a new idea that you know nothing about to reality, to your own reality. You need to make a translation. You need to translate that to something you do know. And a typical translation is a metaphor. I don't know what this is. Well, it's like this. Or, uh, so, okay. And accomplishing new or better things. So new and so forth. Now I'm going to go to means for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we were talking perhaps motivation. Uh, I'm not going to try to pin everything on one of these words, but I think I could. If you work for somebody who says you will invent a new screwdriver, that's motivation. You're either going to do it or you lose your job. Yes? So that's motivation idea. Okay. And means, you have a lab, you have a workshop in order to work on new screwdrivers, if that's what you're, if that's what you're working on, and you have the opportunity. Okay. Uh, a piece of many things that we call creative behavior or creativity is, is the presence of some sort of knowledge base. And in some areas, this is obvious. 
You cannot be a creative physicist without having a knowledge base in physics. Right? You cannot be a creative mathematician without being, uh, having a knowledge base in mathematics. Uh, some sort of knowledge base to work with seems, seems a requirement for being creative. But we're not talking a huge, we're not talking a scientific, a disciplinary knowledge base, although those are all relevant to creative behaviors. We're talking about a uh, stock of language, uh, a stock of even minimal understandings of how the world works. You need some knowledge base. But for some sorts of creativity, it's the sort of knowledge base that children acquire between, say, birth and what? 20 months? 24 months? Uh, you know, I, I've seen work on the creative capacities and actions of preschoolers and toddlers. So the so knowledge base builds. And so you think of new things from that knowledge base, valuable things related to that knowledge base. Um, that's important. And that knowledge base is something like a means. It's something like an opportunity. Now, another um, topic that you see addressed, discussed, and it's sort of on and on. No one, no one, uh, some would like to resolve this. Some psychologists would like to say, and do say, yeah, there really isn't anything, any, any such thing as general creativity. I don't think this is correct. Uh, I won't speak for why people hold that belief. Uh, I don't think it's demonstrated in research, neither my own or other that I've seen. Uh, general creativity and the uh, contrast is domain-specific creativity. So, as I said, if you're a creative physicist or you're a creative actor, uh, creative, you name it, bicycle rider, you're creative in a domain. And if you, uh, oh, a creative um, painter, a creative cartoonist, a creative sketch artist, artist um, Here's the question. If you spend, as a child, say between the ages of 9 and 11, developing and gaining in creative expression in, say, drawing. So the differences between your drawings at age 9 and age 11 are tremendously different. And, and as you go, you build more new ideas into them. And and someone would take, and we've done drawing studies and, and just like this. You take a, a first drawing and you say, that has certain characteristics. You want to look at it as a creative, as a possibly creative product. How does it compare here to the 11 year old? Or the ninth grader at the beginning of a drawing class to the end of a drawing class over six months and look at their drawings and say, what kind of growth occurred? That's a better model, by the way, because a drawing from a nine-year-old and a drawing from an 11-year-old is influenced by a great deal of fundamental uh, psychological and cognitive development that may have nothing to do with creativity. Uh, but so whether you're creative in a specific domain or generally, my, my thought is, and what we've seen in, in some research, is that if you train in a domain-specific area, in an art class, writing music. There seems to be some carryover into more generally creative dispositions. I mean, you can measure it in traditional ways of measuring creativity. Um, so it's just something to be aware of that's going on in the literature. And if you're interested in general creativity, then you're saying the same child will tend to be creative in multiple areas because of certain psychological and cognitive characteristics. And they, I think there is some truth to that. Certainly our evidence points in that direction, others does. 
but there are some important people out there who suggest that that's not true. Okay. Okay, there's a stream of thought in creativity studies that uh, the best judgment of whether something's creative or not is done by what are called domain peers. So these are experts in your domain. The creative physicist can only be judged as creative by experts in physics of one sort or another. Uh, the creative, creative in another domain, creative in paper mache, can mainly be judged by people who know about paper mache and so forth. And so you've got a knowledge domain, and that's pointing to who should be the judge in this situation. You've got new and valuable things, and who judges it? Uh, domain peers. And so, um, I mean, there are competitions that use this. There are uh, professors of management at Harvard University who set up training in, in, in corporations for teams and so forth. And they set up expert panels to judge the ideas that, that come along. And that's sort of, I have, a, I have my own personal set of domain peers. I think I have them here somewhere. The best thing is, they never speak. <laughs> Can I say? Um, now, if, if you might have noticed one of my presentation tricks, I haven't looked at this presentation for five or six days because I don't travel with a computer if I don't have to, and I travel with an iPad and I can't put my presentation on it, is that I put down in the lowest right corner a little hint of what my next slide is. So I used to, and I had this, and I, okay, what's next? You know, ah, now I've got to talk about that. Uh, so I do my little, little things. So here I've got my domain peers, and I've got my little note here that says, in school, who judges? Yeah, there we are. Um, so who judges creativity? Teachers, family, student peers, the student. Some of these you would call external judges, internal judges. Um, if I were a teacher at a school, let's say, elementary school, uh, wanting to have a creativity fair, uh, an exposition, a display, and wanted to, you know, you might give prizes. Some would say you shouldn't. You shouldn't make this a competition. But let's say you were to make it a competition and to have some criteria for, for judging. Uh, I think you would be best off for this going back to ideas of novelty, newness, okay and value. And, but there's a footnote. The footnote is that value cannot be seen in a, in a school context anyway as only in the minds of the observer or the judge. One must think of the value of creative acts, processes, products to the creator. After all, why did you do this? Why do you do creative things in a school? It's not so that you can achieve the greatest thing to come along in 10 years. You do it because you want the children engaged in their own creative processes. And therefore, therefore that begins to present a really good argument for not having a first prize. Okay, what's next? Okay, and I have talked about this. The value of creative thought to the individual is really overlooked in the literature. It is about people inventing products. It is about great artists. It is those things, and it's not really much. I mean, if you go into the psychological literature, uh, 
um, the Journal of Creat Creativity Research, which is edited by one of my center colleagues. Uh, there's more of this sort of thing. But the value of creative thought to the individual is not what people have on their minds when they say our schools should be more creative. It's something a bit different. And so this cognitive process, I would call identity building, identity formation over time for all of us and for children is a creative process. So at some level, mostly conscious levels, but some unconscious levels, as we grow up, we think of who we're becoming. We have ideas about ourselves. The creative part is we can imagine being anything. And in a sense, an old saying maybe, if you can't imagine it, or if you don't imagine it, you're not going to become it. And so we have, you know, we, we ask our three-year-old grandchildren, do you want to be a fireman? And the child's head is filled with the hat and the boots and the uniform and all of that. And suddenly the child's imagining being a fireman. And who knows? They may become an aspiration. But aspirations grow out of imagination, out of dreaming, and identity building. It's a creative enterprise. And, uh, you know, we don't, I don't know if we should or how we might um, focus more explicitly on identity building over time. I think we do it implicitly in schools. You know, we talk to kids about their dreams and that sort of thing. But I, if you sort of capture that as a creative process, um, we think of new things we might be. We think of the value of things we might be. And then you're right in to this discussion. I think is very important. Okay, so now let me see. I've been given my little. Uh, uh, okay, we just finished a study of a creativity lab at uh, an art in institution downtown Los Angeles, and uh, these kids were making. First, they made these towers, and then they built marble roller coaster runs for little balls. So you put the ball at the top and it rolls around and down and all of that. And I'll, I'll, I'll close with this point about this. This is illustrative of, a, I think, a very important point in creativity development, creativity teaching. Um, the kids were given rather explicit instructions about how to build their towers. They need a tower, they need a structure that stands in order to build their marble roller coasters. And so they were given instructions on how to fold paper, how to staple, how to, and, and, and demonstrated how to build this. Okay. So this, in a sense, is being, uh, it, it's developing, but it's, and it's, but it's very direct teaching of some basic knowledge that's important to be creative. These were not creative other than choice of color. They all look the same. But then when it was time to embellish this with a roller coaster run for a marble, little roll ball, kids just did it on their own. They decided how, how wide, how steep, uh, how tight the turns would be. And they built their marble roller coasters. And they all look different. And when in this lab, they did four major units. And they all had a parallel pattern. They gave kids experience with tools and materials. And then let them loose with their creativity. If, if this lab had started with a pile of papers, flat strips of paper, and a stapler, and no models, no instruction, they never would have built them, I don't think. These are 10-year-olds. 
So at any rate, so that's that. And uh, these were some of the tools I've illustrated here. Another roller coaster and all right. Yeah, that's another. These are some of the pictures the kids drew after this lab. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do much. No, I've got some things about. Oh, I wait a minute. There is something here. Um, we ask kids to invent a toy for a friend. I'll close on this one. Uh, what, what would you What would you invent if you were going to create a toy for a nine-year-old? And so one of them says, I'd build a machine that can smell what's inside a present. I would too. Thank you very much.